If you are here for exploding retro hardware, then you have come to the right place. This board is from the scrapyard and I just recently found it. It's a 286 board and it has a 20 MHz CPU on it. It is also equipped with SIM sockets. So this board is definitely worth trying to save. Initially I thought it's just a simple restoration video, but I was very wrong as you will see in this video, which hopefully you will enjoy in its entire length. If you're just interested in the explosion, just go to this timestamp. But for everyone else, let's start from the beginning. So this is a 286 board. Let me turn it around that we can read easier what model this is. Oh, there's a... Let me get this off. So... This is a Octec Fox 2 286 Revision 3.4. And it has a Harris CPU, a CS80C286-20. This 286 has 20 megahertz. And that should mean that we have somewhere a crystal with 40 megahertz. So here is one that has 32. And here is one that has 40. It doesn't have a floating point unit. Here is space for a... 287 math coprocessor chip. Then we have, I think this is the keyboard controller. I don't know what this is for right now. This is the two BIOS chips. I think at that time the BIOS chips didn't have enough capacity, so you needed two of them to store the entire BIOS on it. And then we have memory here. This is in total most likely one megabyte. So 256 kilobytes each. And then we have some unpopulated sockets here. I believe this is onboard memory. So if you don't have any memory modules installed here, you could have onboard memory. I checked already. I may try to get these memory chips and then we can maybe run the board without anything populated in these RAM sockets. But now I guess let's try to get this battery off. This looks really bad, this corrosion everywhere. Ah, very unfortunate. But I like the board because it's so compact. So let's see what the flux can do. And let's get this battery off the board as well. I think I will start with this one. This looks a much better solder joint here. Okay, it melts nice. Okay, and the battery is out. And let's try this one now. Okay, yeah, no, all good, all good, all good. Batteries out. And let's see what we have on the other side. Okay, this board is not bad at all. What I will do now is I will change the camera setup and then we will drop some vinegar on the affected area, move it around a little bit and see how the vinegar hopefully takes away the corrosion. Okay, so here we are, a little bit closer to the board. I think I want to remove these memory modules here before I start with some vinegar. Unfortunately, these memory sockets are all plastic, so chances are you, well, I may break something here. Okay, so far so good. Ah, there we go. I think that's all good. If you want to look up the models of these memory chips to see what size this is. 514400. So let's put some vinegar on this corroded area. Ooh. Once the vinegar did a little bit of work here, I will put this entire board under water and I'm going to wash it thoroughly. Well, some of these things I have to completely remove because I think the battery connector has so much corrosion. There's also underneath, there's for sure something. And this keyboard connector, I'm pretty sure there is 
some corrosion inside as well. Hey, this trace is completely okay. Okay, here on the bottom, this chip here is also affected, sadly. Let's see. There are tiny bubbles forming. I'm surprised. I'm really surprised. This board looks decent. I may not even have to disorder anything. Of course, after I'm done with this, I will definitely still check under the microscope if I can see anything suspicious, but this one looks really good. Unfortunately, with a keyboard connector, I can't do much. I cannot get into the plastic housing. Tantalum capacitors here next to the power connector. I think I saw a video from Peter, CPU Galaxy. He had a board like this with tantalum capacitors and when he plugged it in, one of them exploded. So yeah, you have always to be careful with these tantalum caps. Okay, let me clean this quickly. So I quickly washed the board and it looks really good. There is not much to be done. I still have to take off the battery connector. This one is not good anymore, but I think all these resistors and diodes here are okay. The transistors are fine. Even this chip here that looked a little bit dodgy is okay. And I think this board is okay for now. I'll let this dry now and then I will have a look at it once more. But before we start with the PCB repair, let me thank today's video sponsor, PCBWay. They offer a wide variety of services including CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication, injection molding and of course everything related to PCBs. PCBWay is also currently hosting its 7th project design contest with amazing prizes to be won. If you want to participate, make sure to submit your project until 19th of January 2025. You can also visit PCBWay's shared project space where experts and hobbyists share their designs for you to enjoy. Links to PCBWay.com are in the video description. So I decided to work on the 286 motherboard right away. It is a very interesting motherboard which we will see in upcoming videos. Today I just want to try to make this board work, which has a very interesting chipset. According to what I have read online is that this headland chipset has some features to I think emulate EMS memory from your extended memory, which we will look in future videos, not right now. Today we just want to get this board working. But if you always wanted to know what is going on with MS-DOS memory management, then I suggest subscribe to my channel because I'm planning an extensive review of how the MS-DOS memory management works. I'm doing a lot of research right now to find all the nitty gritty details. But yeah, this is something very interesting and we will try to push the boundaries of MS-DOS memory management. You know, to understand what is going on in the first 640 kilobytes and what happens in the next 384 kilobytes and what is the high memory area, what is EMS, XMS. Very interesting and very complex. Now this board is in very good condition, even though the battery didn't look that good. I already cleaned up most of the corrosion, as you can see. So this is the plus terminal, I think, of the battery. And here is the other one. The board looks undamaged at first glance. Because if I go a little bit to the left here, you can see some of the traces are discolored. Here you can see some discoloration on the trace that connects to this spot where the diode goes through the board and also below this resistor and the terminals of the resistor and diodes and everything that is here also doesn't look that good. We have to replace this battery connector because there was a lot of corrosion below and I think one of these pins looks really bad. And right next to it is our keyboard connector. And this is where I want to start with. 
I already did some measurements with a multimeter and unfortunately mm -hmm. the battery liquid did damage the traces. So even though it doesn't look that bad, let me go closer to these to these traces. I tried not to get ahead of myself, but you already can see a few testing points where I went in with a probe. And you can see already a little bit exposed copper here. If I try to test continuity here, I do not get anything because this trace has disconnected from the capacitor here. And the same is true you can see this maybe here, right there, that the trace stops, where the trace goes into the connection spot of the keyboard connector. So, yeah, this one we need to fix. I could try to fix this board without removing the keyboard connector, but you may already see that there is a lot of stuff in those, in those big vias here. Uh, I want to get all this solder out and try to reuse the connector for now because I don't have spare ones but I ordered I think 20 pieces now I have probably five boards that need new keyboard connectors so that should be sufficient for some time and then we can hopefully try to test this board let's get rid of the solder around the keyboard connector I will use SolderWick for this I hope it is not going to be a difficult task because the solder seems to be corroded. These are the pins. So the solder looks okay, but it was exposed to the battery liquid and it can happen that we end up with solder that doesn't melt very well. All the items I'm using are available on my website, or most of them. If you're interested, just ask and I will add them later on. Yeah, you see this is working quite well. Let's see how much we can take away without damaging the board. Yeah, this is loose, although it's not completely clear. I can remove this later on. There's still some sort of stuck in that hole, but the pin is loose. So let's try the same thing with the other one. Yeah, you can see that the solder is not very cooperative. And you see these bits and pieces that just are stuck together. So this is just corroded solder. Okay. So this will just be a pure restoration video. We're not going to deep dive into the chipset later on and the CPU that's installed on there. Although it's a 20 megahertz 286, I think Intel stopped at 16 megahertz or was it 12? I don't know exactly. 12 or 16, oh, this was nice. Yes, I could have used hot air, but this is a four layer board. That should be all that is needed to get our connector loose. Oh, very nice. And here it goes, very nicely. Here's the connector. Yeah, we can see that those pins inside are also corroded. Now I'm afraid there's a lot of corrosion under these under these metal plates as well. Maybe I should just try to get a different connector from another board and replace that connector then later on. I think this is what I'm going to do. I think this connector is beyond repair. 
I don't want to fix this back on the board and then have to remove it again. I think this is not good. So I will try to look for a different connector. But now let's have a look at the other side. How bad is the damage here? Okay. I think you're familiar with these uh, square shaped sort of yeah, residue that I had a lot on my Asus P2B restorations. They were also quite corroded. These ones break off. That's perfect. I don't have to put any heat on these ones. This is okay. But I need to clean these other ones. So let's do that quickly. Fresh solder usually fixes this. I don't need to apply a lot of pressure, heat, and fresh solder. And then just go around it a little bit. It will take the corrosion away, retins it, and we are good to go. I'm pretty sure the flux also helps. If you do this without flux, you will have probably a harder time. All I'm trying to do here is to get rid of anything that is not supposed to be here. I think these two here may be a little bit more difficult. At least they look a little bit more corroded. Oh, this one was surprisingly easy. This one here looks a little bit problematic. Yeah, I think that's a better approach. Uh oh. I think this one here. Maybe it's okay. What do you think? Looks good, no? So let's have a look at this stuff here. So let's start with this one. We need to make sure to get everything off what shouldn't be there. I think this one looks good. It just needs a little bit fresh solder. And I will add a little bit fresh solder mask over this one to protect it a little bit better. So here we go. This one I have to properly clean later on. This was the leftovers of the solder that was on the solder joint. To double check if this capacitor works. It was exposed to a little bit too much heat, I think it started bubbling on the terminal. But so far, so good. Okay, let's leave this. Let's focus on this part here now. So, here you can see that we have no connection anymore. So the trace stops here and then basically the rest of the connection pad here was eaten away by the corrosion. So there was no connection for the keyboard connector anymore. Here we need a wire. It's too big of a distance and we need to make sure that we get a proper connection. Should be enough. Very nice. So this one basically will just stay there and be part of the connector. 
and this one goes in here. I hope there's enough space, but it should be okay. So here you can see that this trace also suffered. I'm going to just add a small wire here. Okay. Now let's double check if we get continuity. Okay. So now from here to here. Yes. And we even get it to the pad. What is this, a diode? No, L3. This is a ferrite bead. This one, L3. I can see the trace below. But let's check. So this trace underneath goes here and goes directly to our friend here, where we have already the wire attached. Let's see. No. Oh, maybe this one is here broken as well. Oh. I think I'll just I'll just add a wire here. And here's no more connection. Oh. Look at that. Perfect. Nice. Do we have connectivity now? <laughs> no. Does this trace go there? I think here's the problem. Uh, that's very unfortunate. Yeah, I think this is the problem. This one here also got disconnected from... Yeah, there is no connection here. Yeah. Okay, also tiny wire. Okay. I think now we're good. And yes. So now while we are here, where does this one go? I want to see. Where's this trace going? This trace goes here. I guess this one goes here. It's here and goes also here. Yes, so this is fine. This trace, fine. This one, probably, I don't know where this one goes. Maybe some, no, the other side goes here. And this one, this one goes here. I think it should be fine. Let me clean it and catch the sunlight for the solder mask to cure. There we go. Now it's okay. So, time to go outside. Okay, so the solder mask is cured as it looks like. Surprisingly, there is still some liquid here. This looks all like flux that I didn't catch before, but that's okay. I think the rest is all good. It's also nicely hardened here. And all of these parts should not move now anymore. So the only thing left are these pieces here. I think here we also need some wire. This I think is too weak.
I think I should remove this battery connector now. Yeah, see there's nothing of the coating left on this pin. Same here. I think there was a lot of corrosion on this battery connector if I'm not mistaken. Let's see how the other side looks like. Yeah, here you can see how the pins left the square imprint here. And you can still see some of the corrosion as well. So let's take the stuff off. I don't think this will melt properly, so I will add some fresh solder and just scrub over it. Oh, and you can see how the flux reacts with the corrosion here. That's interesting, I've never seen that. Let's take this one here as well. This was beautiful. I think this will work now. Also, third one. Clean, last one. Let's make it like this. Oh, that's a nice fix. There we go. Let's try to make this a little bit nicer. Look at that. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. I think this is almost there. Let's try to make it a little bit more rounder. Like this. I think this is all I wanted to do for this board. Uh, I still have to connect the, install the other keyboard connector, but I think this is all that needs to be done. And then we can test the board and hopefully it will power on and the keyboard connector works and well, everything works as it's supposed to. Okay, and we're done. I think this is this is it. Finished. Yeah, these two. I also got a replacement keyboard connector. This one looks okay. So we'll install this one on the board and then we just have to make sure that that one wire that I installed here is not ripped off or desoldered, but I think that should be okay. So let's see if this one, oh, perfect. This one fits perfectly. And here's the wire that we had coming from the other side. Still a little bit dirty here with some of the corrosion. Let me clean this properly here. Just to get rid of whatever corrosion is left. And then... We can go ahead and solder this keyboard connector to the board. And then I will do the battery connector off camera and then we can test the board. We just need to make sure that this keyboard connector is in a good position. First I will solder the center pin 
that allows me to readjust the connector in case it's not 100% aligned. So let's see. No, this is perfect. So let me take this one out of the way. And let's first solder these two. And then we have replaced our keyboard connector. And here maybe two. Okay. So let's try to close this nicely. One and two. So both of these ones are connected now. Number four. And this one I think I'll just cut right here. Let me put this around the pin. Nice. And let's try to melt the coating of this wire first. So I need a little bit more time on this one. I want the wire to nicely be surrounded by the solder. Okay, I think that's it. We are done. New keyboard connector is on the board. So finally the board is ready, but before we go ahead and test it, I want to look around and see what jumpers we have, what CPU is installed, and then finally we can install the memory and give it a try. First of all, the CPU here is a 20 MHz 286 from a company called Harris, which I've never heard of. So this is new territory for me. I barely had anything to do with 286s, although a 286 was the first PC I ever got in contact with. But probably not a 20 MHz model, it more likely was a 12 or lower clocked model. So if I look around this board, there are not many jumpers that we can see. I think here is one and there is also something printed on the silk screen. So we see monochrome, I guess. Mono means monochrome and color. And I think this is set to monochrome. So this board may have been used with a monochrome monitor or maybe it was just the requirement to have a monochrome display. Then there is another jumper here, which we have to look up in the manual in a moment. This is, what is this, JP1. So JP1 jumper is here. Here is JP3. And then we need, where is JP2? Here is jumper two, which doesn't have a pin header. So maybe this is not required. We can look this up probably in the manual which, by the way, is one of the most extensive manuals I have ever encountered. So I think now that the board is ready to be tested, let's just install the memory modules here. I have to be a little bit careful because all of these sockets are just out of plastic. I don't want to break anything. These are, by the way, the original SIM modules that came with the board. But for now, let's just see if this board works, because I really don't know. I have to be very careful. There are a lot of tantalum capacitors on this board. So I need to wear probably goggles or look in the other direction while powering that board on. But yeah, so this is it. The board is assembled, the board is repaired, and equipped with whatever size of memory this is. So here's the manual, and it has 84 pages. And it looks like somebody may have typed this with a typewriter at some point. But there is so much information here, including some schematics of the motherboard. And I think there are also more graphics in this manual. Math coprocessor, which I do not have installed. Maybe you have seen on my board, there is a big empty socket in the bottom left corner. This is for the 287 processor which I don't have. I don't have any 287 coprocessor that I could use in that system. The memory subsystem, four megabyte using one megabyte SIMs. Okay, so maybe we are limited to a total of four megabytes, but even that amount of memory is absolutely crazy for a 286. 
But what is really interesting is this one. This is something I want to look into in a separate video. That is what I mentioned already before. It will be MS-DOS memory management. And apparently there is a hardware EMS implementation. If you know about HiMem and EMM386, well, for the 286, we need something called EMM286. Uh, this was emulated in software, but this system seems to have a hardware implementation, which is very interesting. And here you see what type of coprocessor you need to install. So we have a 20 megahertz system. You need an AT287-10. And we have a recommendation for memory. So 60 nanoseconds for memory is a little bit interesting to me because I think most of the memory at that time had maybe a rating of 80 nanoseconds, maybe 70. But 60, I think I mostly saw an EDO memory. Then we have system speed. Okay. That may be interesting because I see here you could trigger the turbo mode with the keyboard. So this is also something to be aware of. Press Control, Alt and plus for turbo mode and Control, Alt and minus for normal mode. And what else we have? Jump oh, jumper settings. So ROM size, jumper one. This is the one I didn't know on the board. So it selects the ROM size. And let's see what ROM size we have. We have, I think this is on closed one and two. So we have 256. So they're skipping jumper two, which means we will not understand what function this unpopulated pin header has, but that's fine, I guess. So jumper three, we already seen this on the silk screen, one and two, which is currently configured as monochrome. And we can change the jumper position to get our VGA graphics. And I will do this right now. We have seen that the board is configured for monochrome. So I changed the jumper now to be for CGA, EGA or VGA. Beep counts. Okay, so we also have a small beep count uh, table in here. One beep, DRAM failure, three beeps, base 64K byte, oh, 64K byte memory failure. So this is uh, interesting that they have a 64K byte memory failure. And here is a system configuration summary. So this is what we know from a lot of systems. This is right before the OS boots. And I think this is it. We have gone through a lot of things in the documentation. We configured our board to be compatible with VGA. And now I think it's time to test this board. The board is set up. I need to be very careful when switching on the system now because I have no idea what's going to happen with those tantalum capacitors. Let's see what happens. Let's try this board for the very, very first time. Suckle cement. I knew it. Okay, nothing happened, but... <clears throat> Yeah, one of those capacitors said goodbye. <clears throat> and this is how my thumbnail for this video got created. I guess I will see you back under the microscope. And here we are. That was a little bit unexpected. But, oh well. Okay, what happened to this friend right next to our one, what happened to this one that is right next to it? Oh, this got some sort of splashes all over it. Here's also some black residue left. This probably will not go, or does it? Oh, it cleaned up nicely. Okay, maybe we can make this look like as if Never anything exploded on this board. By the way, here is one half of the tantalum capacitor. So yeah. And of course it's the side without the markings. But all those tantalum capacitors have the same value. I checked this before. And what am I going to use for a replacement? 
this is a Trident TGUI 9440 AGI. I have plenty of those and I already borrowed some components off of this card. So this is a donor card. Uh, it doesn't work properly, so I'm not wasting a completely fine card. But this card has exactly the tantalum capacitor ratings that I need. What do you think? Will somebody ever know that there was a capacitor that just blew up? I think it's even the same, the same marking on it. Just a little bit different, but it has the same design. Okay. So, what do you think? How does this look? Can you spot the one that exploded? Now I guess it's time to try this board again, because unfortunately there is no guarantee that another capacitor will explode. I guess we have to continue until everyone that decides to explode, exploded and we replaced them. I have one, two, three, four, five, six more tantalum capacitors on my donor card, so we can do this another six times. Okay, here we are in test number two. Let's try this board again, this time without any graphics card or whatsoever. I just want to see if it posts and we get still a sign of life. So let's see. Hey, okay. And this is as far as I got. The board seems to be alive, but somehow it doesn't go past postcode 10. Which means base 64k byte memory failure, according to the manual. This board was in such a good condition. I'm not sure if the tantalum capacitor that exploded caused all this. But it would be a shame if we can't fix this board. I was so desperate that I asked a friend if he can help me out. And you may know him. 3, 2, 1, go. It's Tony from Tony359. If you haven't already checked out his channel, please go and do so. I'll put a link in the video description. But he was so kind and offered me a remote debugging session. And we go activity. Okay. Then comes and ground. Then, okay. Um, so that was fun for a few hours. But unfortunately, I couldn't fix it, and I don't think it makes sense to put the entire debugging session right now in this video. But yeah, I'm still stuck with a spore that doesn't post. I have tried so many things already, and I can't recall all of them. But I did test continuity to the SIM sockets, and all connections look okay to me. I even removed two of the dip sockets that were close to the battery to make sure there is no corrosion under them. I replaced both BIOS chips because the ones that were on the board had an issue with retaining data. I tried to boot without the keyboard controller and any other socketed IC to make sure there is no issue there and before I placed them back I used the oxide to deoxidize the sockets. I tested those SIM modules in another system to make sure they are working. They are 1 MB modules in fact, so this 286 was equipped with 4 MB of memory. I checked all crystals on the board and all of them emit the correct frequency. And much more that I will put on the screen, because I don't want to name it all. But there are a few things that are weird. First, the chipset is responsible to give the correct frequency to the CPU. In our case, it should be 40 MHz. Unfortunately, the chipset only sends 16 MHz. Now, I'm not sure if this is because we are that early in the boot process, or if there is a problem with the chipset. By the way, the CPU then takes this input frequency and divides it in half, and this will be the CPU frequency. So 40 MHz will become 20. The state of the board right now is that the chipset sends 16 MHz to the CPU, which halves it and runs at 8 MHz. This seems to be a normal behavior in certain situations, but it shouldn't be in this case, because the turbo feature or the high speed pin on the chipset is high. And this is another weird issue. 
The high speed pin is always high. It doesn't matter what I do on the pin header for the turbo switch. But all this may be due to the early stage in the boot process. One last thing I want to mention is that I have weird behavior on some of the address pins for the memory. Some of the lines mainly stay high. There are the occasional jumps down, but mainly they are high. This is very different what Tony got on his 286 board when he removed all the memory modules, but that might be something that I have to investigate further. Tony suggested that I should check if there is maybe a buffer chip on this board that messes up the address bus. I don't know how to do that yet, but I am about to find out. And of course, if you have any suggestions or ideas what I could try, please let me know. In the meantime, I'm waiting for DIP DRAM memory chips and new BIOS chips. The BIOS chips I have on the board right now are EE PROMs, so the electrically erasable programmable read-only memory, and they are twice the size of the original BIOS chips, so I had to binary concatenate the BIOS files to make them twice as big, and so on and so forth. So there are still a lot of variables that I want to eliminate. But that's it for today. So we have reached the end of the video. Unfortunately, the board doesn't work. I'm really grateful for any input you can give me. I really want this board to work. I hope it's not the chipset or the CPU that is damaged. By the way, the data pins to the memory come directly from the CPU, whereas the address pins and the control pins come from the chipset. So maybe there is something. But anyway, let's hope it's not the chipset. So thank you so much for your time, thanks so much for watching, leave a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so, this really helps me out. A big thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and all my Patreons for their invaluable support. Thank you so much and I hope we can fix this board. And bye bye.